darkness begins to fall on the great house. A darkness that brings new mysteries and deeper secrets to those within it. For tonight, the forces of evil conspire to begin a deadly game while its innocent victims experience terror at Collinwood. my friend, where you tread, for I warn you now, there are spoilers ahead. Welcome to Terror at Collinwood, a Dark Shadows podcast. I am your hostess, Penny Dreadful, taking on the form of Danielle Galerter. And boy, am I excited about my guest today. Wait until you hear what he has to tell you. He has lots of great stories. My guest in this episode is Donald F. Glute, who is a writer, film director, and screenwriter. Don's list of credits is so immense that it'd probably take an entire episode just to read them all, so I'll just mention a few. Don wrote the novelization of the second Star Wars film, The Empire Strikes Back. He's written approximately 65 published books, both novels and nonfiction, plus numerous children's books. Mr. Glute worked heavily as a screenwriter, mostly in children's television shows such as Shazam, Spider-Man, Land of Lost, Transformers, Spider-Man, and his amazing friends, DuckTales, Tarzan, Lord of the Jungle, The Superpowers, Team Galactic Guardians, G.I. Joe, A Real American, hero, X-Men, and many more. He also wrote the first four Masters of the Universe mini storybooks that came packed with the action figures. He created and wrote several series for Gold Key Comics, including The Occult Files of Dr. Spector, Dagar the Invincible, and Trag and the Sky Gods. At Marvel Comics, he wrote Captain America, The Invaders, Cull the Destroyer, Solomon Kane, Star Wars, and What If. His works for Warren Publishing included Creepy, Eerie, and Vampirella. Donald also helmed several films such as The Erotic Rites of Countess Dracula, Blood Scarab, The Mummy's Kiss, and more recently he wrote and directed Dances with Werewolves and Tales of Frankenstein. Many of his nonfiction books have been about dinosaurs, including Dinosaur Dictionary and The Dinosaurs, the Encyclopedia series of reference works. And folks, that is just the tip of the iceberg. Wow. Talk about prolific. I am thrilled, beyond thrilled to have my guest here today, Donald F. Glute. Don, thank you so much for joining me today. It's been so long since we've seen each other. It's great to catch up with you. And thanks for having me on. You know, I love talking about Dark Shadows. Nobody asks me enough about Dark Shadows. They always ask me in interviews about other things that I've talked about zillions of times and it's like by rote. So this is going to be really fun today. Oh, my goodness. Dark, well, hey, you, I, I agree with you. I could never uh, get enough uh, talking about Dark Shadows. So I, I had to start a podcast about it just so that I could get the chance to talk about it with, with uh, Dark Shadows fans such as yourself, not only fans, but creators who've done some really amazing things writing-wise, film-wise. You've done so much. So, Don, tell me, what, what is your background in terms of your interest in um, Dark Shadows? And I know you're a big classic horror fan, too. So how how, well, how did you first discover uh, Dark Shadows and monsters? Well, Dark Shadows specifically, um, I remember there was a show on TV called, um, I think it was Where the Action Is. It was the Dick Clark show. Yeah. And I think I think it was replaced by Dark Shadows. But at that time, when I saw, you know, I saw it listed in the TV guide, so I thought I would give it a shot and watch it. That's when the very early episodes, and I just wasn't interested in the storylines, you know, and mm-hmm. so I stopped. But then I was playing in a rock band called the Penny Arcade that Mike Nesmith of the Monkees was producing. Wow. And we went, to, we went to Las Vegas and spent a lot of time just sitting around the, mot- the, the motel. And I happened to watch Dark Shadows. And this is when they first introduced Barnabas, but they didn't say that he was a vampire yet. And I was really interested in vampires, not only in the movie vampires, but in the folklore and everything, the Montague Summers books and all that sort of thing. Sure. And I was there and I'm, I was listening. This is when they had the Jason McGuire 
Um, I, I remember Jason McGuire was saying, well, why don't we ever see him during the day? And then a little bell went off in the back of my head. And I said, Are this, is this a vampire? Anyway, in Las Vegas, I got, that was like my first injection uh, of really, you know, that's when I got, that's when I became addicted to Dark Shadows. Was this, and, uh, was this in the reruns or was this in the original run? It was the first, first run. Okay. Uh, in the six in the 1960s. And um, I got so, uh, I got so addicted to that show that when I got back to California, I made sure I watched it every day. And if I couldn't watch it, if I wasn't home, I would, um, if I was at his friend's house or something, I would always talk to a friend in the, you know, at four o'clock turning on Dark Shadows. But I was playing in that band and I was in that rock band. And we used to rehearse at Mike Nesmith's house. He had a, a rehearsal room there. While he was and, on the monkey, while he was in the TV show. Was yeah, right. he, wow. he was one of the monkeys. Wow. And he had, the, the rehearsal hall was at one end of the house. At the other end of the house was a bar where they had all kinds of little, you know, um, Slim Jims, sausages and pieces, you know, blocks of cheese and potato chips and all, and drinks. And he had a little portable TV. So around four o'clock, I would always say, I would, I would interrupt the rehearsal. I would say, hey, you guys want, can we, want to take a break for a few minutes? I'll go get some drinks and some snacks. Oh, sure. That sounds great. So I would run over to the other side of the house, turn the TV on, and while I was preparing the food, maybe watch about five minutes. And then I would take the food or take these refreshments back to the rehearsal room. And I would say, oh, I forgot something. And I would go <laughs> back. And I would spread that going back and forth over to uh, the whole half hour and can get kind of a gist of what was going on. Now, this was a time when um, the Adam thing was just started, the Adam story lang, but yeah. he hadn't been brought life yet he was still getting you know dr lang was still getting body parts and things like that and then i remember we played it um we op we were the opening act at a new nightclub in beverly hills called the uh, the factory mm -hmm. but we had to hang around there all day waiting to um, get on stage and, and and do our rehearse our act which took up more dark shadow time so a friend of mine lent me his portable carry-on tv set and I would bring that down to the rehearsals. And during the downtime, I would snatch a few um, uh, a few more minutes. And I remember specifically sitting there behind the, you know, backstage, waiting to go on while watching the episode where um, uh, Tony Peterson sees Barnabas bite Carolyn. Oh, I remember yeah. that specifically. You know, so that show has really... Uh, indelible memories with me. I mean, I love that show. And I was a big fan of both the um, Universal and Hammer horror films, the Draculas, the Frankensteins and all the others. And I was seeing all the all the plot lines they were they were using on um, on DS and and so <laughs> it was a great joy for me. But I would watch I, I was I saw almost every episode in its original run. Once I once I discovered the show. Yeah. And then of course so it reruns and, you know, DVD and VHS and, and all that. And, you know, it was um, a, uh, when I made my last movie, uh, Tales of Frankenstein, mm -hmm. uh, Jerry Lacey was in that. He, play, he plays a character in that. Of course, during the um, the lunch break, uh, you know, that's all we talked about was Dark Shadows. He was telling me all <laughs> kinds of technical things about the show and everything. And uh, and then when we had the, the premiere uh, of the movie and the cast and crew were there, we had a, like a reception afterwards in a restaurant. And I sat down and I, I told him the story about me running back and forth in Mike Nesma's house, you know, uh, <laughs> to watch those episodes. And he was just delighted by that. By the way, he's a wonderful person. I just, yeah. I, I just loved working with him. He came to the rap party and everything. And um, uh, it was just such a great experience working with him. Yeah, he's brilliant too. He's a brilliant actor, and he's been in. Um, I've had Ansel Farage on the show. He did his uh, Doctor Doctor Mabuza trilogy that he did with with Jerry Lacey as well. And I'm glad to see you know that he's still. Uh, he just really has that presence, even in the the Christmas Carol when he was Marley. I don't know if you watched the Dark Shadows Christmas Carol. Oh yeah, I hope yeah. that's going to be an annual event. I hope that's going to be on every year. Available. Oh, I hope yeah. so. Or if they do a different thing every year, you know, a, a different story or something like that would be fun. Oh, Jerry, uh, when we did the, when we shot the movie, he was such a professional, um, you know, he would, with these little nuances that were not in the script, little expressions and little facial things. And, and my editor, I told, he said, I, I had to let this thing go on a couple 
seconds longer than it probably should have gone on because Jerry did this little thing with his cheek or something, made a little thing or a little twinkle in his eye, you know, and you just couldn't, you, you couldn't write that. I mean, it was just, it was all him. It was all his, his acting ability. And uh, what a great, what a great experience it was working with him. Oh yeah, I'm sure. Now, when you were, when you were watching Dark Shadows at Mike Nesmith's house, did Mike Nesmith ever express any, was he, did, was he a fan of Dark Shadows too, or was he too focused if, on the music or? If he was, he never said it. In fact, I was the only one that seemed to have any interest in it. Everybody else was, like you say, interested in just getting the music rehearsed. And that was another joy being a musician. I mean, that was the, one of the best times of my life. It was just, every, I mean, everything was, you know, this was the late 1960s in Southern California. You can imagine what that was like. Yeah, and, oh my God. Wow. And uh, it, was, it was great. It was just, everything about it was great. But Dark Shadows was, um, you know, I had a lot of friends who were really into the show, but I don't think they were into it as much as I was. I don't think if I talked to them now, they would have all the memories. I mean, I could remember lines of dialogue from that show with things people said. And, you know, one thing I was real curious about, too, was um, I didn't really think about this until I started making movies myself. But if you think about it, first of all, those sets, those sets were really lavishly decorated. I mean, they had, you know, yeah. I mean, there, there was a lot of stuff to look at in those sets. And mm -hmm. sometimes it was as many as four and five different scene changes in one episode. So I asked him, I said, how many, you know, cause they had a little studio. I said, how did you do that? And he said, we just had really good set people. And we had like, uh, I think maybe three standing sets. One was the living room, which always changed. Sometimes there was a piano there. Sometimes there was a desk there, you know? Yeah. And uh, uh, I forgot what the other two were. It might've been probably the old house was one. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I don't know what the third was, but uh, it, it, they really did a fantastic job on that show. All things considered, you know, it's um, it's a really amazing what they did. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I've known for you know, that you've been involved in the, the classic horror world for a while. You've worked on on a lot of different things and created the, the occult files of Dr. Specter for Gold Key Comics, oh, yeah. which was, you know, the same imprint that Dark, the Dark Shadows comic was uh, was running on. Were you um, were you involved at all in um, in any of the Dark Shadows uh, material at that time or? Um, no, I, the reason why is. Um, Western Publishing Company, which did the Gold Key Comics, mm -hmm. um, they had two age, two office, two offices. One was in Hollywood, which is where I did most of my work for. I did some from New York, but the other was in New York, and um, they each one had their own um, artists and their own writers that they wanted to keep employed all the time. And they had somebody writing Dark Shadows there. I mean, I could have done a better job, I think, because I knew the show better. <laughs> There was one episode of the comic book where Roger and Elizabeth are um, husband and wife. Yes. And I, I came in and I said, hey, you got incest in one of your comics. And I go, what are you talking about? And I said, well, they're brother and sister. And um, they didn't know that. I think they had a Star Trek one, too, where the Enterprise landed, just landed on a planet <laughs> like, you know, like an airplane. Yeah. And so, um, you know, we, we were more <laughs> savvy to a lot of that stuff. But I did try at one point i did a dr specter episode comic called the story is called dracula's vampire legion i think the title of it was and there's one scene where he or dracula is in the cemetery the reviving like varney the lord ruth ben and carmilla and and he's got a uh, he's got a parchment or a list or something is it these are the vampires i'm going to bring in Later, I'm, I still have, and one was Morbius, the Marvel character, and one was Barnabas Collins. They see they weren't, they didn't really know what the other companies were doing. They didn't pay attention, but they did know when they saw that name Barnabas Collins that I couldn't use it because it was a copyright issue. So uh -huh. they took Artibus out, but they left in Morbius. You know? <laughs> so, so the Marvel character uh, stayed in. Uh, but I, I really, I want. There were two uh, East Coast books I really wanted to write. One was Dark Shadows, and the other was Turok because it had the dinosaurs in it. Yeah. And um, and I was never able to do that. I was able to write some of the Grimm's ghost stories and Boris Karloff's Tales of Mystery and Twilight Zone, which were interesting because. Both Rod Serling and Boris Karloff were were dead at the time, at the time, 
and uh, they were introducing <laughs> stories. So I could say, hey, I wrote for Boris Karloff and Rod Serling, but I can also say I wrote for two actual dead guys who were introducing the stories. <laughs> I have some of your comments. I have the, the Dr. Spector issue. Now, do you, you've, you've put references. Or you, I love that you tried to put a reference to Dark Shadows in uh, Dr. Spector, but you've, I've watched one of your films and you, you referenced the Collins family or Collins port at some point. Do you, did, is oh, that? Oh, yeah. Uh, Dracula is is bemoaning the fact that he met uh, uh, married Elizabeth Bathory. Yes, and he's having uh, this causing him all kinds of problems. And Renfield says, "Why could you met you know? Um, why couldn't you have married a Karnstein or a Collins?" That's what it was. <laughs> That's what. It, which one? Which movie was that one? Countess Dracula. No, that was uh, Blood Scarab. The, Blood the last Scarab. one with my old company. There's another one where. Um, uh, well, if you if you think of the, the the whole the plot thing that I think started with Dark Shadows and then became kind of a uh, a trope for other vampire movies, where the the vampire character finds a reincarnation of his lost love from a century or two ago, I've used that once or twice, several times, I think, and um, and um, I used that in Countess Dracula's Orgy of Blood, and I th- I used it in The Mummy's Kiss. You know, it was a mummy, not a vampire, and and one of the uh, in that one, in Countess Track and the Mummy's Kiss Second Dynasty, there's a scene where there's a museum. <laughs> oh, Children of the Night. Yes, uh, it's my dog, Crispy. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, what music he made or she made. Um, so, anyway, I had a scene where um, there was a like a, 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 a sign in for guests coming to this museum opening, and mm-hmm. this hand. And wearing a like a black cape, you know, just see the hand. It signs in uh, uh, a Spector PhD. Oh, and great! So that, was, that was Dr. Spector's cameo. I always I worked him to a lot of little things, snuck him in the credits in my movies. You know, special consultant D Spector PhD. I never I never read, wrote out the entire name because I didn't know if there's been any legal problem or anything. But I figured the fans. Would, they would know the one. Oh, for sure. Thing. For sure. Yeah. No, um, I love that you mentioned that trope that with, with the vampire recognizing the reincarnation of his lost love. And um, this originated with Dark Shadows. I mean, yes, we had it in the mummy as well, the Karloff mummy, but it was with a, it was with a mummy, but with the the whole thing yeah. with the vampire that and that just speaks to the influence I think that Dark Shadows has had um, in a lot of classic horror or horror media afterwards. And it, I often feel it doesn't get enough credit for some of those things. And that one in particular, I think, is a major one yeah. to the point where we saw it even in uh, Coppola's uh, Dracula yeah. film. Yeah. Well, yeah. well you know. Uh... Dan Curtis was was not shy about swiping plots and being influenced yeah. by plots, and I wouldn't be surprised if he got that from the Mummy. Probably, yeah. <laughs> That's so much from Universal, and I'm finding you know the more I watch those episodes, things that I never thought of before. I mean, not only horror, but he, you know, he the whole thing with Count Patoffi mm-hmm. um, is that's Maltese Falcon. Yes, you know, with, yeah, with Aristide, the whole, yeah. <laughs> All that and then um there's a scene where i forgot which of the storylines i think it was in maybe one of the, it was maybe the and it was one of the past storylines in the past where um the, the the don briscoe character is playing cards with um the um tra, tra, uh, yeah. with evan hanley yeah with Venturian Candidate. Yep, Venturian Candidate. Straight lift from Venturian Candidate. For sure. And they did Gaslight, too, with um, Nathan Forbes and Millicent. They, oh, yeah, yeah. they did Gaslight. Yeah. yeah, there were some things that weren't even horror things. It was just famous movies or famous stories. I, yeah. And Dan Curtis himself was a huge fan growing up of classic universal horror movies and he loved horror stories too and you see him you see him in his interviews his eyes light up when he's talking about the lab equipment and you know i used to love that stuff and dracula used to scare the hell out of me and did you ever get to meet dan curtis at all or no i wish i did and i really wish i could have been on the set to see one of those episodes being filmed i Mm -hmm. i I I've been to some of the conventions. I, I'm always, they always have me as a, you know, I get a, I get a comp at the door and all that. And, um, uh, I, I was the first David Selby appearance. Uh, oh. I was at that and I, I had a great lunch with David Selby and, um, Jonathan Frid. You and had lunch like, with David Selby and Jonathan Frid. That's awesome. <laughs> I will paint this And then years later, about maybe five or six years ago, 
I was getting, I was in Chicago visiting my family in Chicago and I got on the plane and as I'm walking through first class, I saw David sitting there and he looked up. I don't know if he recognized, but he noticed I was reacting to him and he had a big smile. I said, we had lunch together once, you, me and Jonathan. And he said, let's talk afterwards. So after the plane left, um, we were there getting a luggage together. I had a really nice conversation. And I was thinking, my God, you must still have that painting because except for a little gray hair, he looked about the same. Yeah. And, um, he, and he was a very, you know, uh, I, where was, you know, where is he? He was from the South, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. West Virginia. Yeah. Or, yeah. Anyway, he had, he was like the quintessential, what they call Southern gentleman. Yeah. He was really, he had that charisma, that class, that friendliness, you know, that politeness. Um, I really liked him. And he was at the time, he told me his son was producing or directing some film. And so that's what we talked a little about that. And then about a year later, they had a, a Dark Shadows convention. I think they were called Shadow Fest. And it was here right again, uh, just at the hotel right within walking distance of my house. And I went there. I stood in line there with all the fans waiting to get his autograph. And he looked up and he recognized me from the airplane flight. So that was when <laughs> we had a little conversation, you know, and, and that was really nice. They were all so friendly, all the actors. I had the first shadow convention I went to. Uh, I, this is when uh, a, a, a novelization I wrote that I won't talk about was out and it was very hot. So I was a guest there. <laughs> Um, and they had a dinner afterwards, and we were. All, I sat across from Denise uh, Nickerson, oh, but wow. everybody, everybody's at that table. This, even um, uh, Robert Rodin was there, and I was a big Frankenstein fan, so I, I was really happy to meet him. And I don't think he went to many of those conventions, but we all went to dinner. It had a big in a beautiful room, and food was great. So it was, it was a real classy event. And um, I don't. Do they still have those? Those? Uh, um, no, uh, they had the last one they had was for the 50th anniversary of dark shadows in 2016 and then um then they just had a few small events after that that weren't um like they had, i think they had a premiere for the dan curtis documentary but it wasn't not to the extent that they used to have i think um jim pearson who runs those events has i think that was kind of the the swan song for it was 2016 I, everybody keeps talking about that they'd like a new one to to happen, but I don't know if that will. I know a lot of the sources. Well, the cult- last, mm-hmm. the last one I was at was. I mean, I only went to the ones that were here on the West Coast where I live. But mm-hmm. the last one I was at, it was great because first of all, Nancy Barrett was there. I don't know if that was her first. It might have been her first. There was a lot of people there, and they did a, uh, a, you know, like those those. Um, those audio like kind of like radio shows that are coming out that yeah. are coming out well it would they did a live thing like that they did a lot a, a brand new story and had a lot of continuity with the original series you know and they were up there and jerry lacy this was the first time i'm aware of him he went through the character change between trask and tony you know, oh, like you know, he was he was a reincarnation or possessed or something, and right, and he took everybody by surprise. Nobody was expecting that. And then yeah. Nancy was there. I never got to meet her, um, but uh, she was there participating, and uh, it was a it was a, a great event. I remember the first time Jonathan Frid showed up, mm-hmm. and it was it was in, it was incredible. And what a team player he was. He did a performance of his. Uh, the, one of those live shows that he that he did, um, and uh, and then uh, I was trying for a while. I was invi- involved in a movie, a horror film that never got made. I wrote the script. It was called Cuts, and uh, it was about a, a former actor, horror actor who comes out of retirement, and he doesn't like the way the industry has changed. And the, all these mysterious murders happen, you know. And they, uh, anyway, I wanted. I thought he would be perfect for that part. And I um, I got a letter from him. He said, no, I just don't want to act anymore. I'm just, you know, mm-hmm. kind of retired. But he sent me a Christmas card that year. Oh, and, uh, that's I, so sweet. I, that's I, nice. still have, I still have it somewhere. And, oh. um, and that was nice. Yeah. He, that's really nice. Yeah, he could have uh, when I had, uh, you know, I had the the Coons associates on here, uh, Mary O'Leary and uh, Nancy Kersey and Will McKinley. And uh, after that, David Selby interview I did. Um, and they talked a bit about that, how he was offered a lot of roles in the horror genre. And he after Dark Shadows and he only did he did Seizure and then he did and he did Devil's Daughter. That was it. He did not want to do 
uh, he didn't want to do horror and uh, he wanted to do and just acting in general. He wanted to do his own thing. So he did those one man shows, which he, he loved doing that. And he did some theater with Arsenic and Old Lace and um, and Mass Appeal and other things like that. But, yeah, he uh, he was he wanted to kind of do do his own thing. Um, but uh, he could have, you know, a lot of people just asked me that before, just over the years. Like, oh, why didn't he why didn't he do more? more movies and things like that. I just, he, he just yeah. cho- chose not to do it, you know? Well, I, I did meet Thayer David once. Most, most no fans. Kidding. Wow. I went to a, they had a, they had a, um, I went to a play. They had a, I went to a, a live play of uh, a Shakespeare play. I can't forget, uh, I forget which one it, it was, but, um, oh, the actor who, who's that actor who uh, played Patty Duke's father, and he did a lot of science fiction movies. Oh, um, gosh. And from Planet X. And, well, anyway, um, uh, he was the star of the play. And apparently he was friends of uh, Thayer David. So I went backstage afterwards. And, you know, I wanted to um, meet. Um, oh, gosh. I, I feel really stupid now because I met the actor once before at a party. And uh, he's really well known. I know it's just a mental block. But anyway, yeah, I, just, well, I'm, ju- I saw Thayer. Thayer Davis standing there. And he was really tall, by the way. I, I, I had to look William, up William Schaller? William Schaller, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thayer yeah. Davis was really tall. And I welcome him and said, you're Thayer David. And he, he was like real happy somebody recognized him. Another time yeah. I was getting gas. Yeah, I went to the, had to fill my car up with gas. And uh, as I'm pumping it, walking across, you know, the sidewalk by the gas station was John Carlin. And oh, I really, yeah, I really wish I would have yelled out, you know, hey, Willie or something. But I didn't. I was more interested in I didn't want to disturb him. And I was right. interested. My car filled up. Oh, I think so you would have gotten a kick out of it. I'm sure you would have yeah. probably waved at you and, and laughed or something. You know, everybody yeah. loved John Carlin. And he, I yeah. met him very briefly at one of those Dark Shadows uh, conventions in the elevator. And uh, I wish I had talked to him more because I went into the elevator with my late husband and John Carlin walks in and I was like, hi and he was like hey how you doing and he was just he was very you know effusive and friendly but we didn't really talk too much because he he got off on the next floor and i was kind of nervous I, I i don't know why i just you know i got a got a little uh i don't know yeah, I, I, I went up in the elevator with uh james storm once it, oh it, yeah and, and you know i didn't want to you know I, I didn't know what to say and he smiled and i smiled but sometimes when you the only contact you have with or knowledge you have with people are uh, from the performances mm-hmm. and that they're always playing mean characters you know uh, <laughs> yeah, James Storm is so you know, malevolent I, I, as Gerard so. <laughs> so many actors I had encounters with like that one of the biggest gripes is a little bit off topic here but I was in a, a camera shop in Hollywood I was going to buy a screen a, a movie screen and there's a little guy standing in front of me, you know, like a little line, the two of us. And he's all dressed dapper with a hat and a suit and everything. And finally, the guy turns around to leave. He paid his what he, you know, he was talking to the, the, the guy behind the counter. He turned around and it was Mo Howard. And I was oh, you know, a huge Stooges fan. And I really wish I was just like, I'm a, I'm, I was like Ralph Cramden on this $99,000 answer. <laughs> I couldn't say anything. I was like, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a. and. I wish I would have said slap me or something. And then the <laughs> ironic thing was a couple of years later, I ended up working for his daughter and uh, son-in-law. Um, no kidding. At Barbera when I was writing cartoons. And then when Mo died, I said to Norman Moore, who was the story editor, who was, who was Mo's son-in-law, I said, gosh, I'm sorry to hear about Mo. I wish I wish I would have, uh, you know, I could have met him someday. And he, oh, why didn't you let me know? You could have come over anytime and have dinner. Mo loved seeing his fans, you know. Aww. So you know, you know, missed opportunities in life. Yeah, yeah. Uh, when did you when you when you worked on uh, on the cartoons? Uh, what were some? Tell us about some of the cartoons you worked on. Did you ever work a Dark Shadows reference into a cartoon? Uh, I don't. Know. Those were those are so much by the book. They had to be. <laughs> Everything, anything you put in creative like that would get taken out. If you got too creative, I found out that if um, if a story editor would tell me, "Oh, this is the best script we we've ever had," you know, you're not going to get another assignment because it it's not status quo. It's not you know any oh. that low common denominator. So I didn't play too many games with the um, 
with the TV shows. But with the like, Gold Key Comics, I could get away with a lot of things because uh, I had crossovers between stories I wrote and stories I was writing at Marvel. And the fans <laughs> could sort of read between the lines and figure out what was going on. But yeah. they didn't. But they didn't look at the competition. Mm-hmm. And so uh, I could get away with more things, but Dark Shadows is where they caught me that one time. Yeah, that's too bad. Of course, of all things, uh, to catch the Dark Shadows because they knew they knew of it. No, you're you're also you know you're also as you mentioned a big fan of classic horror films of Universal monsters and and Hammer horror and all of that stuff. Uh, as am I. How do you feel about Dark Shadows's place in the sort of the that? Uh, pantheon or tapestry of classic horror um and in terms of you know the larger classic horror fandom yeah, i think some of the characters have certainly become iconic barnabas yeah. has become iconic uh, quentin i think has become iconic mm-hmm. angelique, angelique has yeah. become uh, iconic and the fact that they had two feature-length movies i mean the real movies not the tim burton movie but the, yeah. the real movies um really says a lot i think and they were franchises too. There were comic books and there were lunch boxes and model kits and they're still doing them, you know? Mm-hmm. And, um, uh, I know they had their, the problems with people missing lines and things, mm-hmm. but that was part of the, the charm of that show. Oh, one thing I forgot to mention sure. when, um, when I did a movie called, when I did Countess Dracula's orgy of blood, I had a, a vampire Lord Ruthven from the famous story by John Polidori. Yeah. He was the vampire character in that, the main one, even though Dracula was in it. And he had a long lost love from, you know, a century or so ago who was reincarnated. And I named her Roxanne. Oh, after okay. the, I named her after the Roxanne character in um, Dark Shadows. Yeah, which is she's, you know, she's not brought up very often. She also was a great vampire in the show, too. You know, people always oh, kind of. So, so beautiful, too. She really was an yeah, actress. Yeah. Yeah, Donna Wandry. Yeah, she yeah. she did some of the conventions. Um, she hasn't been too active lately. I was uh, was surprised she wasn't in that involved in that uh, Christmas Carol event. But she used, she did some of the Dark Shadows uh, conventions, as I recall. Yeah, I met her at a convention. It's hard to believe that show was on so so long ago. It's <laughs> it's it's really you know because they're so vivid in my memories, and I don't mean from the reruns. I mean from when I first saw them. What? And I was so savvy about the, the the source material. I remember I was at a friend of mine's house watching the first episode where there was any it was it was the first uh suggestion that they may be doing frankenstein i was sitting there i was saying what i'm thinking what are they going to do next they did dracula and all this and and there was it was the episode where the roger davis character was standing in the middle of the road and the car comes by and the lights shine on him and he's holding a a box that has an arm in it <laughs> I said they're doing dragons. I, right away, I knew what they were going to be doing. Yeah, yeah. I just said, when are, when are they going to do the werewolf story? And yeah. then, then they, then the where when uh, when Jennings comes into the motel uh, and he says what and looks at the newspaper and says, oh, full moon tonight. I said, oh my god, they're, they're here it the comes. Werewolf. Yeah, <laughs> here it comes. When when you get to parallel time and um. You see uh, Cyrus Longworth and he's, you know, in his lab. I said, oh, wait, they're they're going to do Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. I just yeah. you, get, you immediately start getting that vibe. And sure enough, they did it. You know, well, the only- let me tell you about that. Let me tell you about something that, regarding that storyline that has mm-hmm. haunted for half a century. OK, when I, I wrote a book called Classic Movie Monsters and yeah. there was a chapter on there on Jekyll and Hyde. And I was talking about that show and I said, I called the I called uh, the Chris Pennock character Cyrus Layton, oh. which we just popped into my head and said what? And and then I re- realized a couple years later why I called him Cyrus Layton. I'm also a movie serial fan, oh. and there's a serial called The Purple Monster Strikes, and in it there's a character, the the villain, uh, who betrays the Earth, you know, to this Martian named Doctor Cyrus Layton, and that's oh. what I was thinking of. Oh, so okay. when I really when I wrote the afterword of the classic movie monsters book that's being done right now, that's going to be reissued. That was one of the things I said, out of all the mistakes I ever made, and I say this in print, the thing that has haunted me and I've been most embarrassed about for half a century is not getting correct the name of that character. So I corrected in the oh, afterword. Great. <laughs> in the update. Oh, great. Wonderful. Um, you mentioned serials. Just side note. Um, have you seen Mysteries of Myra or is there, there is there any, there's some existing footage of that, right? The horror. Yeah, there's, yeah, there's, there's some existing footage and I think it may be, it may be on YouTube. I've seen it. 
Mm-hmm. And I know what you're going to ask about the vampire character, right? Yeah. There's a van. It says in the advertising of that vampires, ghosts, or whatever. You know, the vampire apparently is a is just a woman who like a spy or something who calls herself the vampire. Okay. You know, kind of like like, and um, you know, there's that there's that was that French serial called uh, Les Vampires, and mm-hmm. and then the old vamps idea of Theodore Barrow and that sort of thing. But I don't think there's a real vampire in that. Um, okay. But there I is supernatural there was, stuff in it, though, isn't it? Oh, yeah. There's yeah. Supernatural. I think there was a cult of people with hoods and all sorts of things. Mm-hmm. Um, I there I didn't have, I saw it, what I, you know, what is extant I saw years ago, and I don't remember enough of what I saw. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's kind of hard to remember. Yeah. But I, yeah, I was curious about that one for years. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. I remember talk about it over the years, and it's um, I I got it. I've seen some like clips here and there, but I'd like to see what exists, you know. Um, but yeah, you mentioned, you know, we're talking about things that show up on Dark Shadows that Dan Curtis was pulling from, and I've brought this up a few times. The one big one they never did was was the mummy, uh, like a mummy story. I think that would have been fun to see something like that. Was well, is there? Mm-hmm. If you count if you count the reincarnation of a past right. love. Then yeah. there was a mummy story, you know. Right, yeah. But you're right. There was no like. Um, I remember the, uh, Marvel Comics did a a spoof years ago called uh, Darn Shadows. Yes, yeah. <laughs> and then they have all these other characters coming out that were part of the fan, and it was like King Tut Collins came out. And it was a mummy, <laughs> you know. So they did it, but um, yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they, they didn't do it. Is there any monster you would have liked to have seen used in Dark Shadows that they didn't do? Well, um, they pretty much used everything. Uh, I, I don't know. Mummy might have been a little bit too ridiculous, but uh, no, I was happy with they with, with them, what they had, you know. And, mm-hmm. uh, and some of them I never expected. I didn't expect them to do Doctor Jekyll and Mister Hyde, but mm-hmm. they did. You know what was interesting too about that show when they did the Jekyll and Hyde series. There was a scene where the girl that um, the the waitress or whatever. Oh, she Buffy, is, Buffy Harrington. Yeah, mm-hmm. she's in her she's in her apartment, and in the background you see something you never saw anywhere else in the show: a television set. Yes, and yeah. It was <laughs> like, like the Collins family with all this money; they couldn't afford a TV set. You know, yeah. it was. Uh, <laughs> yeah, know, but it was the old. You had to go to parallel time to find the TV. Yeah. <laughs> And I told that I told that to uh, Jerry when we were having uh, when we had lunch break for our movie, and he and he said I never thought of that. It never, <laughs> never affected me, you know. His wife, you know, is a, is a very prominent soap opera actress. Oh, Julie, and, Julia Duffy, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And mm-hmm. so, you know, what what a wonderful to, a couple they were. They were just great when they came to the party. Oh, oh. and when he came in. I said, before we go into, I have a little vestibule you walk in first. I said, wait, before we go to the party, I want to show you something. We walked into the room over the right, which is like a reading room. And one whole wall was about half filled with autographed photos of Dark Shadows actors, including Jerry Lacey (laughs) that I got (laughs) when I first met him, like, you know, back in the... 1970s, I guess it was, mm-hmm. at one of those conventions. So, so I was. How did you react to that? Yeah, a big smile. Was, he, <laughs> he he had a really good time at that party, and then he met somebody who had a friend who worked on the show in New York, who was a part of the crew. He's a cameraman or something. So he had a lot to talk about besides my movie, you know. Oh. And um, it was mm-hmm. it was a great. A great evening. It really was. Yeah, fantastic. Now, I, quick question. Um, I forgot to me- ask you this. When you mentioned that you met Thayer David, did you mention Dark Shadows to him? I don't know if I did or not. I just can't remember. I just, uh, I, I just went, uh, you know, you're Thayer. I remember saying, you're Thayer David, aren't you? Yeah. I think I might have said, I'm a big fan or something. Oh, I don't know. Yeah. You never know with some of those people. Uh, and I don't mean Dark Shadows actors specifically, but when, when actors are, uh, you know, get known for something they didn't particularly like doing or didn't have any pride in. they get they get kind of hostile when you say oh oh, I, you know, I don't. oh yeah I mean, right you just just you were erring on the side of caution from yeah, from what right. i understand he loved doing it and i i, I think he would have been because he and he was very invested in um coming up with ideas for his characters in terms of what they're what they looked like and sound you know the he'd work with the costume designer to come up with the with the look of his characters and i think he's somebody you know he passed away 
Um, it's just sort of the very beginning of the of when the fandom was kind of starting yeah. to blossom. And I think he would have really enjoyed being uh, in, at those conventions and things like that. Same with Grayson Hall. She she never ended up attending any. Did you may, ever meet her? No, I never did. I never mm-hmm. met Dr. Briscoe. Um, mm-hmm. I, I saw, I saw um, oh, I, I can, his name is always, is because it's so long, uh, Nicholas Blair. Uh, oh, Humbert Allen Estrado, uh, yeah. yeah. I saw him in a performance uh, of Equus. Oh, wow. Which, and I didn't get to meet him after. It was an excellent actor, you know, yes. just doing, uh, he played a psychiatrist in that. Mm-hmm. And, and that was, uh, that was really good. Um, you know what I should have asked there, David, I should have said, Hey, whatever happened to Adam after you locked him in that room? Right. <laughs> that would have been hilarious. <laughs> disappeared from the series. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm surprised they never brought him back. Like, or at least, uh, you know, in those, uh, even in the big finish audios, they, they used Robert Rodan. He played a, a revenant, like a sailor. Yeah. They never yeah. had Adam come back. And I, my theory on Adam is he's, I don't know if you watched in my namesake series, the Penny Dreadful series, but that character, the, the Frankenstein's monster character in that, I think that's what Adam would have become very, I don't think he would have had the scars removed and lived happily. Nobody lives happily ever after on Dark Shadows. Yeah, well, <laughs> he would have yeah. been just like the Frankenstein monster. He probably would have become more highly intelligent and embittered about the world, I, I would imagine. Uh, there was an article that um, Sam Hall, yeah. Writer- your TV guy that had like yeah. what what happened to all these characters, but I, yeah. I forgot what it said about. He went to Europe or something like that. I can't remember. Yeah, he became wealthy, and then but he still had that link with Barnabas, where he you know. So I think Adam became deathly ill, and then Barnabas became ill, and the, he brought that idea back in the in that article. Um, yeah. yeah. So yeah, it's it's too bad. They, sometimes those dangling plot lines they would leave. They never really went back and addressed addressed them later on. So it would have been nice to, to see that. What do you think about uh, future things with Dark Shadows? Like there's um, uh, this reincarnation series that Mark B. Perry, I interviewed him a little while back and uh, he had some really good ideas about what he wants to do with that. Is that actually happening or is it, does it have the, any of the old actors in it? Or? Um, he, um, if you go back, back and it's a, I have it, it's the episode is up. He talks a lot about that. He, um, he's shopping it around to the streaming networks and he's not giving up on it. I mean, he's, uh, he's at the time, I think this was in December. He said he had two or three streaming networks looking at it. I did ask him about the original actors and he said he would like to do that because he wants to have as much fidelity with the original series as, as possible. So he did mention, uh, that as a possibility. He's a huge fan of the original series too. So I'm hopeful uh, for that one because that's one thing they haven't done. Uh, they always go back and retell the story like with the 91 series and stuff. So they haven't done mm-hmm. a sequel series on uh, TV thing. So that would like a next generation Star Trek thing. Um, yeah. would be well, interesting. The problem, well, mm-hmm. a lot of these shows, you know, that are really, really popular i mean where people just love them you know, a lot of it has to do with the actors yeah and i know the new monster is going to be done now i don't know what it's going to be like but so yeah. many times Dan roebuck is in that he's grandpa <laughs> yes yeah, we just had a show together last uh exactly last last saturday oh yeah uh, radio, we did dr destruction's radio show yeah oh great Dan, <laughs> you know, Danny used to live right here in Burbank. We've been friends for many, many years. Oh, he's but, great. He's such a nice guy, too. Yeah. But sometimes when they do, they try to do Sergeant Bill Coe or, you know. Uh, yeah. Whoever, you know. Wild Wild uh, West. It's, yeah. <laughs> it's the actors. It, it's, you know, almost not, you don't almost care, don't care that much about what the characters are. It's the actors playing the characters. And you have somebody else playing that character. It's not the character anymore, you yeah. know. And I, mean, I can't imagine, like, doing... I love Lucy with two different characters. Right. And know. Barnabas is so, Frid is so iconic as Barnabas. Yeah. I mean, he's a pop culture icon. So it's going to be that. But it's I, I do agree with Mark said you can't do. He feels you can't do Dark Shadows without Barnabas Collins because he's so integral to Dark Shadows at, at this point. I agree with that. But then it's like, how do you recast an iconic character like that? It's that's that's the challenge. That's difficult. I I didn't like the the revival with with Ben Cross when I first saw it. Mm -hmm. But then I gave it a shot a few years ago. And hey, this is actually pretty good. But um, but, you know, I I like the um, the uh, big finish shows for Mm -hmm. the most part. 
Mm-hmm. But I don't, I didn't like the whole idea of Barnabas coming back in a different body and all that. I mean, it was very like, Doctor Who that, that, yeah, because they, well, they I, couldn't get Jonathan to do it. So they, they, but it was this, that, yeah. that's the conundrum. It's like, how do you have, I mean, I guess they could have just said it, it's Barnabas. Yeah, I, or, or I could have got, I, I just, a, you know, a lesser of two evil, evils in my uh, estimation would have been just getting a different actor who yeah. sounded kind of. I mean, just and never say anything about it. You know, it's like other actors that's been done. You know, other actors will play Tarzan and other right. James Bond and all these things. Why? Why not? You know, why not Barnabas? Right. But yeah. Mm-hmm. I didn't like when they uh, one of the last shows. I one of those shows I heard where where everybody kind of knew he was a vampire in the family. And, yeah. And yeah. That's yeah. It started to get into Tim Burton territory. <laughs> it was like yeah, everybody. He's yeah, just open uh, about being a vampire. Um, yeah. yeah. Making- and all that. Yeah, I, I the, some of the later Big Finish stuff. I, I mean, I love the earlier. The earlier stuff had more spooky vibe. There are so many new characters in the new ones that I'm having kind of yeah. a hard time figuring out who's who and and what's going on. And some jokes. One of the characters calls Barnabas Barney, which I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> There's one episode of the TV show where a guy comes in and calls him Mr. Jonathan. Yes, I remember that. <laughs> That's wow. Yeah, I remember you know, that. I uh, yeah, just keep it in. You know. Yeah, Clar- Clar- <laughs> Clarice Blackburn is brilliant because she just kept she she just went right along with it. She didn't. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm surprised they didn't. That's a situation where I know they rarely did retakes, but that's one where they probably should have done done a retake. You know, you know, uh, there have been, and I'm sure there will be more remakes and parodies or whatever done in the future uh, because it's such a popular, you know, franchise. But we can be glad that the originals still exist. Almost yes. all of them are, are still existing, and they can still be. They're still available to be watched, and uh, and that's something. A lot of times, you know, these things get d- destroyed, and nobody ever. It's just in your memory what you remember, and yeah. uh, but we can still watch those shows. Yeah, and we can thank Dan Curtis for that. He he kept all of, all of the shows. You know, there's there's only one missing episode that, and there, at least the audio exists for that one. So even then, you get the audio version of that. And I I wonder if that will turn up someday. Uh, you know that that one lost episode uh the video for it would be very be cool to see that's close to the end but at least like i said we have the audio for it and they reconstructed it using the still images and things yeah, yeah. you know what what also kind of drove me a little nuts because i was always trying to figure out continuity and i actually wrote i actually wrote and somehow it got lost when a website went down and i didn't have a keep a copy of it i wrote a very detailed and carefully worked out continuity of the can the character of Angelique going through time. Oh, which, yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and it, it was, I, I, I could never reconstruct it again, but what all, always bothered me was when they did that last storyline, yep. the curse and all that. And they, and the house has been there to me, the, the house was always the nexus. The, everything stemmed from the house. Yeah. And that was a, no matter what, parallel time or whatever it was in the house was the house and it was built at a certain time but in that one they had the house built like a century before yes and, and that kind of threw everything off and that always kind of <laughs> bugged me yeah yeah that i i know what you mean that 1841 parallel time they established that colin would existed in the 1600s which uh it's a why in this parallel universe how was colin would constructed a century before it was in the regular time band it's yeah. I, I know what you mean it was kind of like so how and the old house also exists in parallel time so if collinwood was built in, in like 1680 how old does that make the old house like it was really old uh it would have been interesting to see more of they never really explain anything. They just kind of throw this information out and it's like, they leave it to us to, to kind of try to put it together. Yeah, I love that you tried to make sense out of it though. Yeah. They think, well, I, I, you know, I, I love trying to figure out excuses for continuity. Mishaps. Me too. I'm the but, same way. Like, yeah. <laughs> the universal and the hammer films. Oh and yeah. And believe me, I pretty much figured them, most of them out, you mm-hmm. know, and it, you got to remember one thing about those movies all you're seeing on the screen at any given time are what's happening at that moment in given and in, in given time. You're not seeing what happens between the movies and you're not seeing happen what's happening necessarily while one character is on well one character is on the screen, another character is doing something else that you don't see simultaneously. And, mm-hmm. and 
you, sometimes you have to fill in your own blanks. But you know, there in, in there, one of the things was uh, in um, the Hammer films, they couldn't figure out how the movie The Evil of Frankenstein fit in with any, with anything because it it's it's a flashback to something that has nothing to resemble what happened in The Curse of Frankenstein. <laughs> and I saw. And I thought about that, and I thought about that. And then I remember there was a scene, with, it's in a carnival, okay? Now, they established in the trailer to Revenge of Frankenstein, the date, and it was like 18, I forgot what it was, but it was like middle 1800s, 1850 or something. And then they show this carnival scene, and in the carnival scene is a Buffalo Bill character. Buffalo Bill wasn't doing any of that sort of thing, any of those kinds of appearances, like around the turn of the century. And then they showed the string of lights hanging in front of a, over a guy's doorway and house, lights that they didn't have back when Revenge of Frankenstein was uh, set. So, ergo, it's two different set of memories. It's it's uh, Revenge of Frankenstein happens about thirty or forty years before Evil, so mm-hmm. it's a complete different monster he's referring to and all and i love figuring out stuff like that me too uh, it's it's like a puzzle it's fun yeah yeah i figured out what happened with uh you know people are always complaining about an abbott costellamy frankenstein the scene where dracula shows up in a mirror Mm -hmm. you know and when he attacks um the the female vampire there and i looked at the script nobody ever looked bothers to look at the script in the script that scene's not in there in the in the script he is in the full, he's not in the smoking jacket like he does in the movie. He's wearing his full, you know, tuxedo and everything. And he stalks, he stalks his victim to the wall at the other side of the room and raises his cape. There's no mention of a mirror or anything. So that was obviously done as a, a decision made on the set while they were there. Hey, this would look kind of cool. Let's do that. And yeah. Lugosi, who was on kind of shaky terms with with Universal, wasn't going to say anything. He didn't want, you know, want to risk losing his job. And it all makes sense. Yeah, the it was probably a yeah, directorial choice to to shoot it that way. And um, yeah, um, I, know, I, I watched I watched the two Dark Shadows movies last night. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I watch them together. One, you know, the house of and then night of, and it's really, I, I still, I still can't figure out why the first movie is so. Cl- I mean, you know, they had to condense a lot of things, but it's basically the TV show. Yeah. And the second movie was, was so totally different, and I thought actually pretty dull. And I don't know why they did that. They had the actors and everything. Why didn't they just do uh, some other kind of acquaintance story or something? It's, well, I'm surprised I, they didn't do a werewolf story. Uh, with yeah, Since right. they had Quentin a witch, and Angelique, they could have done a witchcraft werewolf story. But, yeah. Uh, I would have liked to have seen a full I, – I still want to see the full version of Night of Dark Shadows because that was – really badly edited and they cut so much of the film out and Darren you know, Gross you, has reconstructed it. So I'd love to yeah, see the you, full version. Uh, I asked when I was getting getting my luggage with David Selby, I asked him about that and he said, well, nobody's paying any money or to do it or, you know, just kind of sitting yeah. around. But do you know what was cut out? Do you have any idea how, what would have been filled in? Cause it's a long, it seemed like a long movie. I don't know how long it is, but it seemed mm-hmm. probably to me, a lot longer than it actually was. Yeah. But, oh no, there's more than thirty minutes that was cut out of the movie. I know the there was a seance scene that was cut out. Um, that was a pivotal scene in the film. There was a uh, a lot of the flashback stuff was cut out to from the 19th century, uh, from 18, uh, 1810 sequences. They cut all a lot of that, not all of it, but a lot of that stuff out, and it makes more sense when it's all put together. I have the script, uh, Catherine Lee Scott and her publishing company, Pomegranate Press, released the script, a book of the two movie scripts, House and Night of Dark Shadows, and all of those scenes are in there. You can still get it, I think, out of print, but I think you can get it on Amazon, Dark Shadows movie book, I believe it's called. And uh, all those scenes are in there. Um, But Darren Gross located all of that material except audio, the audio track was missing. So they re-recorded, they got the, all the surviving actors to re-record audio. Um, when Robert Colbert was still alive, he helped them with the music cues to figure out where things go. And um, Darren and Ansel Farage and other folks have worked to sort of put this thing together. Um, and I think it's just a matter of Warner Brothers giving the okay to release that. And I would love to see it, you know, with all these streaming channels they have now, it seems like a no brainer that, that would like around Halloween, if they did the the fully restored night of dark shadows, because I, I would like to, I think it would be a better film if we see 
the whole thing, you know. Mm. You know, another strange thing about that movie too is, you know, the first one. One of the wonderful things about it was uh, uh, it had all the music from the television show. Yeah. And in uh, Night of Dark Shadows, it's about half the music is that that kind of theme, that pretty jo- theme. Joanna's theme. Yeah, they did use that in the show, but it was you know only. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. In the 1840 storyline, there's a character, Joanna Mills, who usually comes back from the dead. Um, Spoilers. I I put a spoiler tag at the beginning of every show, but she that's her theme. And they play it. I don't know if they play the harmonica portion of it, though. I think it's more the piano version of that theme, but it's that theme. Well, you know, it's funny, too. When I watched the first, you know, I've seen that House of Dark Shadows many times. Mm -hmm. And one thing that's always bothered me was. How did Stokes, when he comes to the house, to the old, how did he know that Barnabas was a vampire? And and finally, I heard the line last night when when Barnabas is beating up Willie, and he says, "Who else did you tell?" And he goes, "Professor Stokes," really yeah. fast. Yes. And I never heard that before. And it just went by me, or maybe I was, you know, eating some popcorn or something. I don't know what I was doing, <laughs> but I never heard that before ever. Yeah. And. Uh, and that was uh, so that mystery has been solved for me. Yes. Yeah. Did you see those both of those when they came out in the theaters? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I did. And uh, I remember when I was sitting there, the moment uh, Barnabas comes on before he's on the screen, when he just kind of he, he says, you know, he says, uh, I want, I'd like to see Elizabeth. When he first comes into the house, mm-hmm. uh, the audience just cheered, cheered loud. When, and, when Barnabas and, came in. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that must have been great to see that at the time, you know, with a live uh, with an audience. Yeah, yeah. that's great. Yeah, I, I, I saw I saw Night of Dark Shadows too in a downtown Chicago theater. Mm-hmm. Have you Have you ever gotten to meet Kate Jackson? No, and no. she I don't think she's ever uh, shown up in anything. Has she? She was she, really beautiful. Too. She yeah she she yeah she did uh, well. She went on to great fame, of course, with Charlie's Angels, and but she did um the Paley Center event for Dan Curtis when the, when Dark Shadows was uh, honored at the um, Museum of, of Television Radio Broadcast. Um, she was at that event, uh, which is not a convention, but it was like a big event honoring Dark Shadows and Dan Curtis. And she did attend that. And she did uh, the interviews for the DVDs, for the MPI DVDs. Oh. Which, yeah, she's in those interviews. Yep. Uh, but uh, she's never done like one of the Dark Shadows conventions. I don't think she does any conventions. I've never seen her listed yeah. as a guest at any cons or anything like that. Well, when I saw the movie last night, you know, you remember that was made in the 70s. Mm-hmm. At the same time, and I, I don't think this occurred to me back then, but I was maybe it did. And I forgot. But I was writing the Dr. Spectre comic book. And at the time I was trying to, you know, trying to sell it as a TV series and a movie. It never happened. But uh, I have one producer in, interested as a TV series, a la Night Stalker, you know, that kind of thing. And um, I, what a perfect, uh, if you remember, he had this secretary girlfriend uh, named Lakota Rainflower. She would have made a, she would have been perfect to play that part. Yeah, yeah. Black hair, the long, thick black hair. Totally, yeah. Um, you mentioned Night Stalker. Did, did you ever get to meet Darren McGavin? No, I, I was at an event once that he was at, and I saw him like standing across at the other side of the table, and then he he left real quick. I didn't I didn't get to meet him though. Ah, uh, he was great. He was he was fantastic. There's a there's a crossover, a, a Dark Shadows, Kolchak crossover, the Moonstone comics. I think they did it. There's there was like a story um, with the with Kolchak meets Barnabas. I have that somewhere. Uh, I, <laughs> dig that out at some point but yeah so um, i mean that's another great dan curtis uh, project at least the, the the original film the night stalker and night strangler um I was, dan, I was, I was, I, oh, go ahead oh no i was going to just say i mean dan curtis did a lot in that documentary i wish they had talked a little bit more about some of his horror output that he did they touched on it but they didn't really explore it and he had such a substantial output in terms of the things that he did in the, in the horror genre especially from the 60s through the 70s uh until he started doing the winds of war and war and remembrance but before that he did a lot of horror stuff you talking about the documentary that came out on dvd a few years ago yes yeah mm-hmm. yeah i thought it was pre- overall pretty well done though yeah, it was good. Oh, no. Yeah, it was good. I just wish they had 
explored that, but I guess there's only so much time you have, right. To do that. Don, do you, so any closing thoughts in terms of, is there any like dream dark shadows project that you would like to work on personally? Well, I, I mean, I would love to, you know, write a comic book series or something on it. Oh, um, that would be great. I, one question, which has always been on my mind about the show, maybe one of your guests can answer it or you can, uh, if, if professor Stokes was, uh, such an expert on the occult and the supernatural, he never got an inkling that there was anything to do with vampires going on in that series. And there was so much of it. How did he, how, how was he so ignorant about all that, you know? You know, it's interesting because he, he really is, he's the Van Helsing of the show, really, in terms of being yeah, a sage yeah. occult scholar, you know? So uh, this is a conversation that I've had a few times on, on this show that I've brought up, and it's a debate. Did Stokes figure it out and just not say anything? Because yeah, yeah. at the point where he meets Barnabas, he was, when he first meets Barnabas, he's a vampire, but shortly thereafter, he is, you know, the, the Adam thing happens, and yeah. now he's seeing Barnabas in the daylight. I suspect Stokes figured it out but uh, he didn't he kept it to he, to himself he kept it played his cards close to the chest because barnabas is cured after or cure, quote unquote cured although he goes back to being a vampire later I, I think stokes is he's too smart not to know you know he he's such an occult expert on some level he must have figured it out i'm interrupting myself I, something else just occurred to me it's possible that stokes didn't figure it out because in 1995 he still doesn't seem to know that barnabas is a vampire right um i still say that he did figure it out but there's another if if he didn't if he didn't figure it out could there be a supernatural explanation for it is it possible that something was preventing Stokes from uh, picking up on the rampant vampirism in Collinsport between even outside of Barnabas with Tom Jennings and uh, Megan Todd, um, Roxanne Drew, and uh, vampire Angelique? You would think Stokes would notice something like that. Maybe there was something blocking this knowledge. Maybe it was the spirit of Ben Stokes still protecting Barnabas somehow. I don't know. Uh, that's a possibility. And another, the biggest question of all, the biggest mystery of Dark Shannon, maybe somebody can figure this out. How did that Afghan and that <laughs> painting that looks sort of like Jesse James, that framed portrait. Yes. <laughs> how did those keep turning up in different places? I mean, there must be some supernatural <laughs> thing going on there. It must. I mean, it's Collinsport, so of course, of course, there must be some supernatural explanation for it. What else is there? What, what, oh, what you, else know, could... <laughs> yeah, you know what else? I wish they would have done. You know the the famous Barnabas portrait. Yeah. Right before that happens, the storyline is Sam Evans wants to get his paintings back from Roger. Yeah. And Rogers starts his search through the house of old paintings. Why didn't they do the connection there? Why didn't why didn't somebody find among all these old paintings the Barnabas painting and then hang it up on the wall? Because yeah. suddenly they, they, there was a missed opportunity there, and there yeah. it, otherwise it just showed suddenly that painting's on the wall. You know, for a few episodes before the Barnabas character is introduced, but that would have been cool. I thought if somebody would have actually, hey, who is this? And then he could have talked about the legend of the jewels and all that. that he yeah, was they could have worked in a line because it just shows up at well, the first time you see it is during the end credits. Oh, like, yeah. And it's just there on the wall. And they could have that would have been interesting. I think it just would have been a nice touch. I agree to just throw in a line. Like, oh, look, we found this old painting. I found this old painting of one of our ancestors when we were looking. Uh, oh, yeah. we, should, we should hang it up, you know, something like that, yeah. maybe. Yeah. They did that with other characters. They did it, I think, with the painting of Angelique at one point. You know, mm -hmm. it's a, really, uh, a, a pleasure on this interview. This is the first time I've ever spoken to anybody in my life that knows that show as well as I do. Oh, and I can repeat all these little references and the little esoteric things, you know, like like what you just said. I can remember that those end, end credits of that episode where on the right side of the screen, as the credits are rolling up, is that, you know, uh, is the portrait. Yeah. They don't call any attention to it or anything. It's just there. Yeah. And, and uh, it's great being able to. It's like we have the same memories. It's amazing. Yeah. yeah. Oh, Don, gosh, it's, it's been my pleasure to to have you here to to chat with me. It's been way too long since we've had a chance to to talk. And the last time I saw you was at a convention and it was very, yeah. you know, very, we didn't get to really chat too much and certainly not 
much about Dark Shadows, although I've known for many years that you're also a big fan. So I'm glad we got a chance to do this and that we got the audio thing worked out here because we were having some audio yeah. issues at first, but you sound crystal clear yeah, to me. I think I may have been the first person to write an article about the show involving the plot and everything, which appeared in Monsters of the Movies magazine. And it was all, this is before anything was rerun, anything was available in yeah. a video, all memory. And I got some things wrong, of course, but mm -hmm. my memories are in that article as I saw yeah. those shows for the first time. Yeah. And, uh, Did you write an article, uh, other articles like Monsterland and Vampire Tales about Dark Shadows? No, I think that was the only one. And then I mentioned, I think I mentioned the, not a whole lot about them in some of my books, but mm -hmm. um, I think I think Monsters of the Movies is the only one I actually wrote. Okay. I, it was called Dark Shadows in the Afternoon was the title oh, of the article. Oh, yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. I might have that one. What's on the cover? Do you remember? It may have been the shot. It may have been the one issue with uh, Barnabas and Van Helsing. Uh, yes, I love Barnabas. that cover. I have that hanging on my wall. I have a Dark Shadows display uh, and I have a clue of collectibles and I have that issue hanging on the wall. <laughs> and there was a fun article to write because, uh, you know, again, I didn't, there was nothing. The only reference was my memory and it was fun just thinking back on the show and remembering and being forced to remember certain things about it. And um, so writing that article was a great memory in itself. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's fantastic. Well, Don, I hope, uh, I hope we get to see more uh, dark shadows related articles from you. And, and hopefully I would love to see a comic book series, a dark shot, a new dark shadows, comic book series written by you. Uh, signed, I'll be first in line to, to get that. Uh, absolutely. I would love, love to see oh, that. <laughs> so hopefully that will happen. Um, I had Jim Beard on here the other day and we were talking about a dark shadows fiction anthology series series of short stories how how cool would that would be they've never done that you know we've had novels but never an anthology of by different authors that would be mm -hmm. i'd love to see a story by you and in, in something like that okay. folks thank you so much for listening today it was a pleasure having um donald f glute here uh to chat with me and please be sure to like and subscribe to the podcast let's keep the podcast growing let's keep the candles lit so thank you very much for listening and for as long as they lived the dark shadows never truly vanished for there will always be terror at collinwood terror at collinwood is a penny dreadful production